UFOs, unidentified flying objects. People have reported seeing them in the skies for millennia. Ancients who saw mysterious lights in the sky believed the gods had come down to visit them. Moderns have developed other stories, that they are intelligent life from other worlds, or top secret government aircraft whose very existence must be concealed at all costs. There is a small network of dedicated and sometimes fanatical people who search for answers to the UFO phenomenon. They cite thousands of UFO incidents throughout history as possible evidence of alien craft visiting Earth. Their nemesis, the United States government. UFO believers say the U.S. government routinely withholds information about unidentified flying objects, both to protect clandestine military projects and to keep sensitive intelligence about extraterrestrial technology hidden from the public. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. On tonight's program, two close encounters haunt the people who say they have experienced them. Mysterious lights in the sky over Phoenix in March 1997 lead many to believe an alien craft flew over the city. And a disturbing story of two women who say they have suffered medical problems for years after a UFO encounter outside Houston. Does evidence exist to prove that alien craft have visited Earth? Or is it more likely the government has something to hide? Will it remain filed away under the code name Unexplained? During the second week of March, 1997, many Phoenix residents noticed strange lights in the sky. Each night at around 9 p.m., a curious display would appear. Throughout the week, a buzz began to build in the UFO community. Cell phones, pagers, and websites spread the word of unusual aerial activity in the skies above Phoenix. Skywatchers Tom King and Bill Hamilton grabbed their bizarre but professional homemade camera and went to the Gila River Indian Reservation for a better view of the lights. I looked at it for a few seconds and thought, it's not aircraft, I don't know what that is. I thought, it's time to go to battle on these things. So we ran down to the cars, we got our video equipment, we went back up there with the video equipment and the telescope and the binoculars and the whole shooting match. See? And we started videotaping. Well, that the first light went off. And then about 10 minutes later, a whole formation of lights came on. They showed up again. And this time, there were more of them. Then another light showed up, close to the location the first light originally did. And then, a minute later, a woman screamed, there's another one. I didn't know which one to film. They were so far apart. But then another one, another one, another one, another one came on until there were four. I said, this is a major sighting. This just doesn't happen normally. These things were close. They were about the size of your thumb with your hand extended of your thumbnail. They were like orange suns, very bright, but they illuminated nothing around them. I mean, nothing. There's four of them. Look at this three of them all together. I got the third one popping. Hold over to your left. There's one behind the chimney. One just flared up. I got four of them. Major sighting here. That's, no, there's five. Oh! Another one just showed up. Whoa! Maybe somebody's setting up lights. No, those are in the sky. Holy. Mike Kristen watched the lights from a position 40 miles north of where Tom King was filming. For over three minutes, Kristen recorded the exciting display. So when I saw this light, I figured, well, I'm going to get it on tape, at least show it to somebody, maybe they can tell me what it is. Well, as I was filming this light, then all of a sudden, all this, this entire display and sequence of lights start to come on over here. It was like hitting the jackpot. Figure this one out. There's a double. There's a third one. I was pretty steady with the camera. Uh, the only mistake I made, of course, was uh, going in and out with the thing, and I was starting to get blossoming in the lights. But then I called my wife, uh, and she came out here, and, that's, and she was pretty excited. And what I filmed was at 10 o'clock at night, and apparently sightings of the flyover uh, occurred from quarter after eight that night all the way to 10 o'clock. 
uh, that there were many, many witnesses to it. Hey, Sue, take a look at this. Submit it for your approval. What have we got here? Oh, my God. I hit bay dirt, finally. Well, that is a totally different configuration than we've ever seen before. Yep. No one knew what they were seeing, even those trained to watch the skies. A commercial pilot and his wife, an airline attendant, both were right under the baffling sight. They have chosen to keep their identities hidden. And these lights were massive, and they were in a V shape, coming, going southbound and moving rather slow. So I listened, and there was no sound in the neighborhood, and the, this massive V was blocking out the, the stars, and the fact that it wasn't making any noise gave me a chill, I mean, right up my back. At about the time it's right overhead, that's when I realized, I don't know what I'm looking at. It's not fighters, it's not a large aircraft. It's going so slowly that it almost appears to be floating in the sky. So I just stood there and watched it intently until it went out of sight. Coles reporting the peculiar event poured into the Phoenix Police Department's 911 system. We got several calls. As you know, that people don't know who to call when something like that happens, so the most obvious number that they're going to dial is 911. Unfortunately, there's not much we can do for them. We don't know if it's the Air Force. We don't know if it's a government. We don't know if it's a UFO, to be honest with you. Citizens called nearby Luke Air Force Base to find out if it was behind the aerial show. In the weeks following March 13th, the Air Force did not comment, but the Arizona National Guard claimed it had no planes on maneuvers that evening and said its radar detected nothing unusual in the sky. Despite the denial, the Phoenix Police Department insisted that the military must have been up to something. We've got New Mexico to the east, we've got California to the west. A lot of missiles are launched on a clear night, you can see them for miles. We can see them here in Phoenix. When you see something that's unexplained, it's probably gonna be something else with uh, the Air Force or somebody doing a launch. But many weren't buying this explanation. Phoenix City Councilwoman Frances Barwood decided to raise the issue during a council meeting. Apparently, the Air Force or any, nobody is doing any investigation on it, and I'd just like to know if anybody has any information from the city and if the city is checking into it, apparently. From what I saw on television, it was about the size of a football field, and there was uh, seven lights, and they all moved together like they were attached to something. So we don't know if it was a prank or, um, you know, something that was just huge out there. But, you know, kind of curious, especially since people are starting to ask more questions. Thanks. Thank you. There was a silence, and then they went on. And it was like, okay, what was wrong? After the meeting, one of the deputy city managers came over to me and said they really didn't want to deal with it, and I shouldn't have asked the question that I opened Pandora's box. Following the meeting, Barwood was ridiculed in the press and by some colleagues in City Hall. To Councilwoman Barwood and many puzzled citizens, it was clear the city had no intention of taking her seriously or conducting an investigation. The March 13, 1997 sighting over Phoenix was one of the most widely viewed UFO events ever recorded. Thousands of witnesses reported seeing the lights, and it was captured on videotape, making this UFO sighting unique. While the public demanded explanations, the military declined to comment, and the city government ignored requests for an investigation. These skywatchers decided to take matters into their own hands. Ted Lohman was one of the most prominent UFO investigators to enter the fray. Lohman is a metallurgist who in the late 1980s was nearly blinded in an industrial accident. During his recovery, his father shared with him a lifelong interest in UFOs. Lohman immersed himself in what believers call ufology. Later, he created a television program as a public forum for the UFO issue. I got involved in television through public access in 1991 and set out to show the world, if you would, that the UFO phenomena does exist with credible people speaking on the subject. 
Ted Lohman was frustrated by the government's refusal to seek an explanation for the Phoenix Lights. National Guard and Air Force officials gave conflicting and what UFO investigators believe were misleading accounts of the sighting. The flow of information was erratic at first when we tried to go through n normal channels uh, from what the investigators have told me that they originally called Luke Air Force Base. The woman at the end of the phone said, yes, we're having a rash of calls. Within a matter of minutes, they turned around and said, no, nothing is happening. Then they come out with something else uh, months later saying, oh, there were flares in the area. The Arizona National Guard originally claimed it had no planes in the sky on March 13th. In May, after USA Today published an article about the incident, it changed its story, saying the visiting Maryland National Guard had dropped flares over the Gila River gunnery range in training exercises. Lohman decided to have the Phoenix Lights home video footage analyzed to see if this new explanation could be confirmed. When I receive something like the, the Phoenix Lights, you have to take it to people that, that deal with this. So I either get in touch with uh, Jim Delatoso or somebody that is in the field that I feel competent that will look at this with an open mind and tell me what they believe that it is. Jim Delatoso is a UFO enthusiast and president of a company which produces computer graphics for entertainment and aerospace clients. He frequently collaborates with UFO investigators, analyzing film and videotape of alleged sightings. We've been investigating UFO pictures for over 20 years for other investigators. We're like a police lab. We don't publish reports. We give information back to other investigators. We do it for people in Russia and Brazil and Florida and Canada and all over. So when the Phoenix Lights happened in March 1997, we opened it to the lab to investigate and measure it. Not trying to prove or disprove that it's an extraterrestrial spacecraft, I'm measuring for data. Dilatoso supports Lohman's belief that the Phoenix sighting can't be dismissed by the explanation of flares. So we can compare to airplane lights, car lights, hail bop, flares, and see if we get a match. We didn't get a match. Geophysically, when we triangulate or quintangulate the five different videos that have been shot, we position it in a location that isn't even remotely close to where the National Guard allegedly set off flares. And that only lasted 10 minutes, the setting off of flares. This event happened for hours on the night of March 13th. Many witnesses dispute the location where the military claims the flares were dropped. They also insist the lights didn't descend or illuminate the surrounding mountains the way flares would have. And I'd just like to, to say that the V of lights that I saw that night was absolutely not flares. I've dropped these flares from my helicopter in Vietnam. I've been on the ground in Vietnam when the flares have been deployed above me. I've seen the flares from fighters uh, being dropped by other fighters. Flares have a real distinctive flickering. They're suspended by parachutes, so they wouldn't stay in a perfect V orientation as they traversed all the way across the sky. Were there flares? Possibly. The Army or the Air Force says there were. I believe that something else was going on. What was going on was a show. It was for the people in the Phoenix area. It lasted too long to be a set of five flares, and that was it. What really happened on March 13, 1997? Did thousands of Phoenix residents see an extraterrestrial craft pass over them between the hours of 8.30 and 10 p.m.? Skeptics question the investigative techniques of the so-called ufologists. The burden of proof on a UFO event is on the person telling the story, not on the person debunking it. You must, if in science and in really in life, your proof must be so that there's no other explanation that is more logical, more easily accepted, more likely to have happened. Months later, the Arizona National Guard finally gave an official explanation for the lights over Phoenix. They claimed the sightings were caused by a visiting air unit on maneuvers over southern Arizona. The 830 tape was a formation of aircraft flying through the area. 
Later that night, around 10 o'clock, these were flares that were dropped by a Maryland Air National Guard unit flying A-10s on the range uh, southeast of Phoenix. All that anyone saw was a bunch of lights, and some people connected the dots and made this one object. Even some in the UFO community say flares could have been responsible for the sightings that occurred at 10 o'clock, but say conventional aircraft could not cause the flying V formation seen by witnesses between 8 and 10. The pattern looks military, but the witnesses certainly have a different impression of what that was at 8.30 that evening. If you look at the flight path, and this is very important, uh, you're looking at coming from Henderson, Nevada, and if you go and, and continue a line northwest uh, of Henderson, you're going to go into uh, Nellis Air Force Range, and you're going to go into Area 51. Area 51 is the Shangri-La of the UFO community, a military base in the Nevada desert, undeclared on any government map. The UFO community believes that the government hides many of its UFO secrets at the infamous base. The first reports came from the northwest and directly in line with that corridor. Now, a lot of speculation was brought about by being something coming from Nellis Air Force or Area 51, a super secret, some type of a spy plane that came in this direction. These sky watchers aren't certain they know what made the March 13th lights. Theories of spy planes proliferate alongside claims of alien craft. But they are united in demanding that the government release whatever facts it has to the public. I think I can speak for the majority of the people within the field of ufology that we want to get the truth out. We might not want to know what the truth is once we get it, but we want to know the truth. Many people, including at least one city councilwoman, has asked for an investigation on what happened. When I work and I pay taxes, I pay for that jet fuel and those jets they train in. And when I have a serious question and evidence of what I captured on tape, I demand some answers. I think there's a, an unwritten law that you don't ask about these things if you're in government. And, you know, they have made fun of so many people that have said, well, they saw something. I've never seen anything in my life, but obviously something was out there that night. Hundreds of people have told me what they saw. They all described the same thing. There was something there. Despite the clamoring from the UFO community, the military has insisted it has nothing further to say about the Phoenix Lights of March 1997. Major sighting here. Some people join the UFO community as a result of what they call a close encounter. They believe they have seen aliens, an alien craft, or simply something they can't explain. Two women say their lives were disastrously altered by an encounter with an unidentified craft, and the UFO community was the only place they could turn to for help. Betty Cash owned a cafe in Dayton a small town 40 miles north of Houston, Texas. Her friend, Vicki Landrum, worked with her as a waitress. At 7 p.m. on December 29, 1980, the two women drove to a church in New Caney, Texas, with Vicki's six-year-old grandson, Colby, for a bingo game. When they discovered that the game had been canceled, the three headed home at about 9 p.m. We started back out of New Caney into Dayton. All of a sudden, uh, Colby looked up and he said, Grandma, what's that bright light? It was where I could not even see the middle of the highway because the light was so bright. And Vicki screamed for me to turn. She said, Betty, it's coming right at us. Stop. And it had been raining, so we couldn't get off the road and turn around and go back. So we just had to stop. I got out on um, the passenger side, and holding Kobe, and Betty walked to the front of the car and stood there looking up. And I was screaming for her to get back in the car because I was afraid she was going to get burned up. The three had stumbled onto what appeared to be an aircraft in distress. The vehicle sent down a stream of heat and flame onto the asphalt and the occupants of the car. It was a diamond-shaped thing. I mean, it 
was similar to this, and there was flames coming out of the bottom of it. My curiosity is bad, and I was going to try to find out what it was. The light was so bright, it was blinding me. And I was standing there trying to find out everything I could. And so Vicky kept screaming for me to get back in the car that we were all going to burn to death. I just grabbed the door handle, and when I did, it just pulled all the meat off my hand. Flames from the craft had heated the automobile's exterior to scalding levels, burning Betty when she opened the door. Once inside, she turned on the air conditioner to try and cool the car, which had become unbearably hot. Terrified, they watched the craft struggle to regain flight for what they estimated was nearly 10 minutes. When it finally raised above the road, Betty Cash drove her car away from the scene. It kept going up and coming down. And so um, finally it went slowly up and it moved slowly, not flew away, slowly um, toward Houston. And uh, just as it began pulling away, we began seeing helicopters. And they wasn't the little bitty kind. They were the kind they used to, to parachute people out. I counted 23. Vicki said she counted, I think it's 21. But we were all so excited and, and terrified, we didn't know what to do. They were chasing the object. They didn't even let on like they knew that we were down there. So they were, they were going in the same direction the object was. And they were losing no time getting there. Betty Cash frantically drove away to escape the craft as Vicki Landrum tried to console her grandson. But as they raced down the rural highway, they kept crossing paths with the strange caravan. We drove about eight miles. There was a whole bunch of helicopters that were flying in with their searchlights on. They flew over us, and they were the big kind. Betty Cash, though badly burned on her hand, neck, head, and chest, managed to drive the car home to Dayton. Vicky had burns on her face, Colby on his back. Dehydrated, the three consumed large amounts of water and told friends and families what had happened. Betty's 20-year-old son tried to convince her to go to a hospital to be checked out. When the local news carried nothing of the event, she decided to wait. He begged me to go that night. And I told him what had happened. And I said, Toby, if we go to a doctor, they'll think we're crazy. I said, I've got to go on to bed. So I did. I went on to bed. And I was so sick all night, up chucking. The next morning, I woke up. And there was big gobs of hair on my pillow. And I had blisters just all over my face. For several days, the women refused medical attention, fearing they wouldn't be believed. When Betty's condition worsened, she relented, and all three went to the hospital. And we didn't know we were hurt that bad. And uh, when we did go to the hospital, um, the little boy told him that, because uh, I told him I'd whip him, but the um, little boy told him, said, you can whip me now, but I'm going to tell the doctor what happened to us. Doctors were baffled at the source of the strange burns to Colby, Vicki Landrum, and the most severely injured of the three, Betty Cash. The illness that she suffered three weeks after her exposure was an absolute classic radiation injury. And we, she lost skin, she lost hair on the exposed side, she then had diarrhea, vomiting, and all the illnesses you get, and it was exactly on time. And I don't think she would have made it up. And the other thing is I don't think that she could have made it up because she didn't know it. And she's precisely on time for describing uh, what would be a two gray to three gray radiation exposure. They kept asking me, uh, how did I get burned? But I didn't have any earthly idea that the object was a probability of radiation. All I knew at that time was radiation was used for cancer. Betty remained hospitalized for over a month with her injuries. After her release, she could no longer work and was forced to close her restaurant. 
She has suffered only losses from the very beginning. She was economically devastated by the illness that she had after she was radiated. I've been giving her medication for years to try to help her out through all this. Later, she did get breast cancer and had mastectomies as well. All of this, she was uninsured. No one was going to insure her in the early 80s uh, for any price, probably. Vicki Landrum and Colby's injuries, though not as severe, left them with lifelong skin and eye troubles. Desperate, the women wrote to Senator Lloyd Benston and Congressman Charles Wilson to ask for medical help and answers. I had received the letters back from Lloyd Benson and Charles Wilson telling us to go as soon as we were able to go, that Bergstrom Air Force Base knew all about it and they'd be glad to help us in any way that they possibly could. They said there'd be doctors up there that could help us. And we went up there, and um, they um, treated us very dirty. Officials at Bergstrom Air Force Base told them they knew nothing of the incident and informed them their only recourse was to try and sue the United States government for damages. Strangely, however, the military repeatedly attempted to purchase Betty Cash's vehicle, but she refused. As word of the incident spread around Dayton, Betty and Vicki felt ostracized by their neighbors. A minister offered to come to Vicki Landrum's home and pray with her alone, but she refused. It was then that the women turned to the UFO community for help. Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum have been ridiculed and ignored since their alleged 1980 encounter with an aircraft. But the UFO community refuses to let the case die. John Schusler is an aerospace engineer and deputy director of the Mutual UFO Network. MUFON, as it's called, is a worldwide organization of UFO believers who study and investigate sightings. The women contacted him several weeks after the incident. Schusler was curious but skeptical until he met Betty Cash. She took her wig off and she had big patches of hair missing from her head. And that was so shocking, I, I said to her, I said, look, something very serious happened to you. And if you're openly honest with me and give me the information I'm looking for, I'll stick with you to the very end. I said, I need to talk to the other people that were involved in this case. And so I called Vicki Landrum and I talked to her and her grandson, Colby. We asked them, why did you just go home uh, after this incident happened? And they said, well, you've got to understand what happened. They were what you might say, healthy Texas stock people. When something happens, they tough it out. They don't just run for help. Mrs. Landrum said, we always tough it out. I never go to the doctor. I never go to the hospital. I don't take medicine. When I'm ill, I tough it out. And so that's kind of what happened in this case. Convinced of their story, Schusler agreed to look for answers. Then we went out to the site where this happened. They had never been back. We took them out one at a time. They, they each one took us right to the very place, even though they'd never been back from that night because they'd been too ill. And we walked through the scenario, and we timed it, and we understood what happened, and we looked at the roadway that was burned and the trees that were burned. And uh, we saw the emotions in these people when they got back to the place. They just broke down, completely broke down, cried. And they were so frightened from it, they still didn't want to be there. And uh, after that, we decided, well, we'll let them go home, and then we'll start walking the roadways. Schusler began to canvas the area for witnesses to the incident. His investigation revealed that a Dayton police officer and his wife saw military helicopters in the sky on the night of December 29, 1980. He had other witnesses too, civilian witnesses, that weren't as alert about what helicopters are, but they could describe them with two rotors on them that made them very unique. And there was no one else but the military flew twin rotor helicopters in 1980. We started asking for those kind of records from the military. Uh, we were just completely stonewalled just like these people didn't exist and the information didn't exist. And so that started our quest for more information and a long, long drawn out investigation. Through the Freedom of Information Act in 1982, Schusler obtained what he feels is the smoking gun in the case, the official military report on the investigation into the women's claims, which called their story credible. With Schusler's aid, the two women hired a lawyer. To me, it seemed to be a a truthful story. 
Uh, yes, I've had people who try to, as the saying goes, strap a story on you. I don't believe they were doing that. And the evidence uh, contradicted that too. Nearly six years after the alleged incident, Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum believed they might finally get some relief. They filed suit with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Houston, and a preliminary hearing was set for August 1986. Of course, the federal government denied they had any connection with anything like this, and uh, we didn't have any way of proving that the federal government was involved. All we could prove is that women were injured. Who injured them? We couldn't prove it. And so the judge says, I'm dismissing the case. Their hopes crushed. Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum eventually left Texas to escape the painful memories of their ordeal. Eighteen years after the original incident, after the tabloids and local press tired of their story, another UFO investigator still searched for the answers. We're uh, coming into Dayton, Texas. You know, there's a mystery here. I've done investigations. I've done undercover operations. Uh, I've been involved in homicide investigations. And there's uh, hard evidence. There's eyewitness testimony. As an investigator, I believe that those answers are out there. And eventually, we may be able to bring this mystery to a conclusion, show a picture of what transpired on uh, December 29th, 1980. Ken Storch is a police officer in suburban Denver, a member of the Mutual UFO Network and a former U.S. Air Force sergeant. During his military service, Storch says he was forced to sign a document preventing him from discussing a UFO incident. His unwilling participation in an alleged government cover-up made him sympathetic to the experiences of Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum. Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum and uh, Colby came around that corner uh, and were confronted uh, with an unknown. Uh, and there was an object that uh, was brilliant, diamond-shaped, uh, emitting a high uh, intensity, uh, they say a flame, light of some sort, a power source. According to Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum and uh, John Schuchler, uh the craft, when it came down from the sky, uh, irradiated uh, an intense heat, causing the uh, blacktop to uh, bubble, melt, uh, contaminating the surrounding area. This is a classic encounter, right? We're at ground zero where it happened. This is it right here. John Schuessler visited the site three weeks after the incident and noticed changes made to the road. We went back out a few weeks later and looked, and that section of the road was dug up and replaced, completely replaced. We contacted all of the road agencies around, state, city, county, and all of them said, we haven't worked on the road. We found some witnesses that said they did see people working on the road, and they, the trucks that were hauling the stuff away were unmarked. Six to eight weeks later, the same crew came back in, tore it up again, and repaved it again, removing, uh, in fact, digging down, removing eight inches or six inches of, of uh, surface uh, in the process. And if you look closely in this section of between, oh, 150, 200 yards, you can see that there's concrete and asphalt, and the texture changes dramatically, and it's just in this one section. I mean, it's not like it's the whole roadway. Storch notes that the changes made to the asphalt surface run parallel to a cluster of small trees lining the roadway. There's young growth here that's just very, very uh, young, and then the trees off in the distance here are probably 40, 50, maybe even older, but this, this lack of trees in this specific area, I think indicates that uh, uh, they were removed. Why? Investigators believe the U.S. military repaired the road to hide evidence of Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum's unexplained encounter. I believe that there is evidence yet to be uncovered. And I truly, truly hope that, that by keeping this in the spotlight, by keeping the pressure on, that, that uh, we'll be able to uh, get those answers, to get that witness that will come forward and say, hey, I flew the helicopter. I was there. And it, I feel bad what happened to those two ladies. I think it's very important for the civilian UFO groups to continue to work on this. 
until or unless there is some reason for them not to, and that would be a government disclosure. And when people have UFO encounters, they need help. They just want somebody to tell them they're not crazy. Officials at NASA and Bergstrom Air Force Base declined comment on the case. Betty and Vicki believe the U.S. government has lied to them about their involvement from the beginning. They've ruined my health. They've ruined my life. So what else? What else is there that they can do other than kill me? And they probably would love to do that. But I'm so stubborn and hard-headed that I'm going to show them I'm going to be around to fight just as long as there's a fight left in me. Are Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum victims of a secret military program gone awry? Has a conspiracy hidden evidence of that fateful night in December 1980? They took the case to court, uh, and they lost in federal court. They could not prove that anything uh, had happened to them that was a result of the government doing anything. I think they got carried away. Remember, there's something like 10% of all UFO reported cases are hoaxes. People fraudulently created this or report something that was, they know was not true. The UFO investigators see too many coincidences in the case for it to be a fabrication. Any kind of radiation can be mimicked by some other device, admittedly, but it's the combination of effects where you have multiple witnesses, eyewitness reports, substantiating other witnesses, plus the medical evidence in the case that took place at exactly the same time. This case had all of those things. I believe that Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, encountered something. My gut feeling is that the government is involved in it up to their eyebrows. I think that we need to uh, uh, impress upon uh, Uncle Sam to, to lay those cards down and let us have a look at them and let us evaluate that database. Critics think the UFO community is looking for answers from the government which simply don't exist. If not enough evidence is collected for people to do an objective analysis, no matter how much you think you've had an experience, no matter how strong your recollections, people aren't being cruel when they tell you, we can't continue the investigation. They're being realistic. There's no more we can do. Skeptics dispute the conspiracy theories that surround many UFO cases and claim the government has no reason to conceal the truth. You can, after the fact, construct almost any event and make it look very strange and weird. The military, in my experience, does not lie about what it does. It's too concerned about its public relations image. First of all, the, the government has every reason to lie. And second of all, the government does lie. There are tons of evidence where they've been caught with their hand in the proverbial cookie jar. The uh, Alabama incident involving uh, the black uh, males that were subjected to testing, the GIs that were taken out into the desert uh, in 1940s and 50s and subjected to uh, atomic blast, and the government is turning their back. Uh, I, I would say to this gentleman that crap. Across the United States and around the world, UFO enthusiasts meet to swap stories, share data, and commiserate over the government's unwillingness to comment on these mysterious phenomena. One of the most vocal critics of government secrecy is retired Sergeant Major Robert Dean. He held a high position during the 1960s with NATO. Dean says he saw a top secret military document containing information about UFO incidents which he claims nearly brought about World War III. The document essentially dealt with the NATO study of the reality of extraterrestrial intelligence, the UFO matter. Now, there were large circular metallic objects flying all over Europe. They would fly in formation and they would disappear off of NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea. This issue had almost caused we and the Soviets to go to war at least a half a dozen times over the years for the wrong reasons. Once I realized that this was a reality and not myth, legend, it had an impact on me, which I've never quite gotten over. Dean and his wife Cecilia have formed an organization to educate and lobby for congressional hearings on the UFO issue. Stargate International literally is an international organization devoted to one basic thing, bringing out the truth of the UFO and the extraterrestrial intelligence issue which has been covered up and sat upon 
and denied for so many years by not only our government, but practically every government on this planet. The time has come for the American government to tell the people the truth. Our goal has been to influence government, to influence uh, Congress, to hold congressional hearings, and to do it perhaps not for them necessarily to release UFO materials, modern UFO evidence, but at least to give us a form in which we could release it. Robert Dean believes that the government's policy of denying the existence of UFOs and withholding evidence violates our constitutional rights as U.S. citizens. I swore an oath to give my life, if necessary, to defend the United States Constitution. I didn't take that oath lightly. I've been through a whole bunch of wars, some that you know about, some you don't even know about. And it's become very clear to me that our constitutional process is literally endangered by this lying, by this cover-up, by the 50 years of deceit and deception. Dean believes the government has hundreds of stories it has yet to tell about UFO encounters. According to Dean, the 1997 U.S. Air Force press conference revealing facts about a 1947 crash of an alien craft in Roswell, New Mexico, was yet another deception. We are very, very proud of this report. We think uh, in our office that this answers lots of questions and it answers them logically and with integrity. Look at the absurdity of what the Air Force has had to say recently about Roswell. First it was a balloon. No, no, it wasn't a balloon and yet, yes it was a balloon, but it was a different kind of balloon. Now the story is that, oh, they were dropping crash dummies without bringing it out in the air that that was 10 years later. I say to you and your generation and to your viewers that you people are not going to take this anymore. Is the United States government withholding secrets from its citizens about UFOs and extraterrestrial life? I held a top secret code word security clearance. It's the highest security clearance that you can hold. I do not believe that the military can keep secrets for significant periods of time. Certainly secrets that a lot of people would like to know about, like UFOs. Lots of people make claims about various things the military is doing or has done, but they can't produce any evidence. The UFO community passionately believes the government is hiding these secrets and evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. We're standing right outside of uh, basically one of the openings here at Area 51. A lot of mystique surrounds it. Uh, we don't know who, who runs it. The government has denied knowing anything about it, but yet it becomes one of the most top secret government bases in the world, stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. My feeling, my take on it is, is that out there in the desert there's probably some bones buried, literally crashed vehicles. Like Ted said, you know, I hear the stories, I, I read some of the articles and some of the testimony, but we don't have physically uh, a crashed saucer from Area 51 in our hands and an and ET lying beside it that we can show to the rest of the community. Most skeptics, while admitting that there may be alien intelligence in the universe, don't believe it has ever made contact with Earth. UFOs exist. People see things they can't explain. They always have, they always will. That's okay. There will always be UFOs as long as there's anything in this universe we don't understand. I don't think that we're going to be negative to it because what does it gain us? We know if someone has gotten here what they represent technologically. Our only hope in dealing with them is that they come here in peace. If they don't, we might as well surrender. I think we already have made contact. I, I believe that they're walking on this planet as we are ourselves. And maybe in the millennium that's coming up, maybe through social changes and through government changes, we'll be able to readily accept those that are coming and haven't arrived and those that have arrived and we just haven't been able to uh, notice them. For the UFO community, it's not a question of whether we make contact, it's when. These sky watchers will keep their eyes on the stars and pressure on the government and their search for indisputable proof of an alien craft. For the rest of us, the truth about who inhabits the heavens and what secrets the government may be holding will probably remain 
unexplained. I'm Bill Curtis.